don't know this, but we did. Up until last night, we didn't have anything scheduled for tonight. <laughs> now, how do you like them apples? We've always had everything planned and scheduled and worked out and knew exact every service. You know, we, as it gets down to those last few days, my wife begins to structure it, you know, what every service, the worship, she'll start in a couple of weeks, she'll start putting together worship for next high places. And thinking about meditating upon, praying about what's going to be the theme. If there is a next high places, the next high place could be in the high place. <laughs> We'd love that, wouldn't we? That would be all right. The message tonight is kind of a connector between last night's and tomorrow morning, Esther's tomorrow morning. I titled it, because I'm real good at titles, I really dig deep and hard to come up with this great profound title. And all my digging and meditation and thinking and praying, I come up with this, there's more. <laughs> so we're going to read some scripture. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 3.18 from three different translations. You're writing that down. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with open faces, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Why is the glory we talk about important? Because the Spirit of God works in that atmosphere, works in us. Again, up until revival, we never talked about this. I don't think we ever understood it. Let me read it now from the Amplified. And all of us, as with, unveiled, with an unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into His very own image, in ever-increasing splendor, and from one degree of glory to another, for, his, for, this, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The NIV says it this way, And we who with unveiled faces are, all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with, I like this, ever-increasing glory, which comes from the presence of the Lord, who is the Spirit. I'm just, as a, a kind of an example, share a story that I've shared here one time before. I don't know when that was, but, uh, but it, it fits the situation. It fits the story. It's about a young teenage boy. It's a summer vacation, and he was bored. So he decided to go to church. And while he was there, he felt the conviction, convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He responded at the altar call and gave his heart to the Lord. He continued to go there for several weeks and they had a, a, a youth meeting one night that he went to and feeling somewhat despondent, somewhat discouraged, he left the meeting and went out and sat down on the steps of the porch. And the pastor going by, seeing him sitting there and looking discouraged, came up and sat down on the steps next to him and asked him, you know, what, what's the problem? And the boy 
just kind of staring straight ahead, not really looking at the pastor, just sharing what he was feeling, asked the simple question, is this all there is? And the pastor, which is interesting, his response said, afraid so, son, this is it. Being now even more discouraged than he was before, got up and left and never went back to church. A few months later, a friend of his invited him to come to his Pentecostal church. And so he decided to go. And having sat through that service when the altar call came for those that would like to receive the Holy Spirit, he went down and God graciously filled him with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But the question arises again, is this all there is? That should be a question that's on our minds. Is this all there is? But I got news for you, and according to the Bible, there's more. We're going to start where we left off last night. And we see in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, Moses, I got to pick this up to go where I'm going, but I'm not going to dwell long on it. Moses, in the backside of the wilderness, having been tending sheep for 40 years, is attracted by a burning bush. And he's drawn aside and to find out what's going on. And as you remember the story last night, but for those that might be seeing this on, on YouTube, or whatever it is, <laughs> God told him, before you approach, take off your shoes. For the ground upon which you stand is holy ground. What made it holy? He was there. So we talked a little bit about holiness. Something that's not a very popular term, not term for this day. We want to live like we've always lived, talk like we've always talked, act like, look like, just like the world. Like I said last night, no difference except we tithe. But the issue of holiness is important when you approach God. And I thought about this since last night, and I shared it with my wife after, after the service was over. I thought, that's a good point. And I need, to, I need to share it with the folks, because when God gave, and we'll get into this a little bit more on this aspect, but when God gave the plans of the tabernacle, he gave the, uh, the three levels, the outer court, where you deal with your flesh, and then the inner court, and here's, here's the important thing. He says, the inner court is what, what did we say? The holy place. We talk about the priest still has his shoes off when he goes into the holy place. And everything in that place has to line up with the designs of God in our attitudes and our heart and how we view one another, how we do, view the house of God, how we act and how we react within the in the in the body of Christ in the church and, and how important it is to the presence of Christ in the lampstand and, and the moving of the Holy Spirit which fuels it all and the fellowship of the saints, all that. But here's the thing. And then we, when we go up to, went up to the altar of incense, our worship and our intercession, that's where I stopped. But there was more. Because beyond this place, in the holy place, is the holy of holies. Why is that important? Double holy. Remember we talked about when you hear something once, eh, when you hear it twice, pay attention. When you three, hear it three times, that's off the chart of importance. I mean, that is up there. You need a stepladder to get reach how high, and that's still not high enough. Why is that significant? 
Because when you reach the third level into the heavens where the angels cry day and night, they hit the three level. So you have that holy place, the holy of holies, and the holy, holy, holy. You follow me? There's levels of advancement in a church service. And because this veil is torn, there are seasons and time, and some, most of the time, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing because it's not. Most of the time, we, we, in our worship and our intercession, we're in the holy place, and that's wonderful, that's good, and that's rightly so. But there are seasons of time and degrees in worship that when we're here, the, the ancient Jewish teaching is on, on the uh, worshiping at the altar of incense. I don't know about the modern teaching because things have so changed and the mentalities of the modern church and the modern Jewish thought has so changed. But they believe that in this place when the priest is standing at the altar of incense that, that he's supernatur supernaturally translated into the holy of holies. What happens when you're in that place, not really unlike this morning or this evening, all of a sudden everything around you vanishes. And all you focus on, all you see is him. And when you leave from this place and you're translated by the Spirit in your worship or in your deep travailing and intercession, when you're translated into that place, time disappears. And you can be in there for an hour and think you've only been there for two minutes. And that, the only thing beyond this is that. I think that's where John was on the Isle of Patmos. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and all of a sudden he was seeing into the third heaven, and he sees the throne, and him that sat on it. That's revelation that comes. You don't have that revelation out in the holy place as awesome and as wonderful as things that God does. Understanding what I'm trying What is it that gets us there? It's holiness. That's why a lot of people don't get there. We don't talk about it enough. We don't stress the importance of that enough. And so here's Moses... And he's at the, at the burning bush. And God tells him to come nigh, take off your shoes, come close. I'm going to talk with you. And so Moses has this revelation of God. God gives him an assignment. I want you to go back. You know the whole story. I want you to go back to, to Egypt. I want you to confront Pharaoh. I want you to bring... My, listen to what he says. I want you to bring my people here that they might worship me. That's important. Bring, go get my people, bring them here that they might worship me. And that's the message. From that encounter... That transformed Moses' life. He was never the same after that. From that encounter at a burning bush, standing on holy ground, he went back single-handedly and confronted Pharaoh. Now that's pretty amazing to me. One encounter, just at the burning bush, he experienced enough transforming power, enough of an encounter with God that it totally changed his life. It changed his direction. It changed his purpose. It changed everything about him at that moment, at that encounter, that he went back and faced off Pharaoh. And Esther, on yesterday morning, went through the list of the things that God did through him and the facing off of the leading gods of, the, of, of Egypt. That's pretty an incredible, pretty amazing thing. And Moses was so excited. I remember when I first got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I didn't, you know, you know the story, but 
I wasn't sure what really happened. I didn't really know what it was that happened. And, and so I was, Moses might have been like this when he went back to Egypt. And thought, Man, you guys ain't not, you are not, you're not going to believe what just happened. I mean, he's probably still having to process this through his mind. I just encountered God in the desert at the foot of a mountain. And he said, when I ask him who you are, what will I tell him? He said, just tell him that I am that I am. <laughs> that sums it up. That, says, that said a lot. And he, he understood. Whatever it is you need, I am. And with that, he goes back. And he was, I don't know, I'm, I may be ma making this up, but I'm just like, to, Moses was human. How many know Moses was human? And he possibly was so excited, met his brother Aaron. He said, Aaron, you won't believe this. Little brother meeting big brother. You know how that often times goes over. Family structure. Aaron, you're not going to believe that. Oh, don't tell me. I already know. God already let me know. And that's, that's why I'm here. Well, that fizzled that testimony out. <laughs> <laughs> but he went back. His whole goal, think about this, from that encounter, because I told that cop that stopped me that night I got saved, I, said, I pointed over at the high school in, 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 in St. Helens, and I, I didn't even know what I was saying because I didn't know what it meant. I said, every kid in that school over there need Jesus, and I didn't even know what that meant, but I, I knew that's what they needed. You know, I was just so excited. I wanted everybody to experience what I had just experienced. And that's what was on Moses' mind. He's going, and he's going to bring that. I'm going to skip through all of the ordeal that, that they went through. And Esther covered that pretty thoroughly. And he, and he got them out. And, they, and they've crossed the Red Sea. What God, and I mean, he was not going to let anything get in his way. He was so excited. You got to go to this church. It is so awesome. I've been in church before, but I've never been in a church like that. And so he faces all these challenges. He probably got frustrated with the people griping and complaining because he just wanted to get back to that burning bush. He wanted to get back to that place that, where his life was transformed. And so he's leading the people, and he has that, that delay. Come on, God, let's get this going here. Let's get this, oh, let's get this water parted. And he puts out that rod water part, everybody goes over and, and, then, and then they get up and then they're murmuring and complaining at tomorrow's water and oh my goodness you folks are just shut up and keep going and, and, and he's so excited he's inviting a nation to church and so they're coming across and the, 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 the territory through, through the wilderness, you know, to get to. Not, and I, I, can, I can just almost imagine, you know, if he was me. Now everybody knows that Moses looked like Charlton Heston. Yes. <laughs> For you younger generation, Charlton Heston played Moses in the movie Ten Commandments, okay? And I, I just pictured, so here's, yeah, play with the camera. <laughs> here's Moses, and he's walking out in front of the people up there, and he's got a big grin on his face as he's getting closer. Come on, folks, you got to see this. You're going to have to experience this. It is so, you will never be the same. And, and, he, and he's getting close. All right, you guys, get ready to take your shoes off. We're almost there. There's the parking lot of the church right up there. Come on, get ready. Hurry, let's, let's, let's catch up. Let's get up there. there. This is awesome. You will see. You will experience it. It'll blow you away. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I, I, I you know, he, never mind. <laughs> but he was excited about this. God said, bring my people out 
and bring them here that they might worship me. And that was the whole thing. That was the, the call that he shared every time with Pharaoh. Let my people go that they might go and worship their God at the mountain. And in his mind, the only thing he understood is what he experienced. That's important for us. The only thing we know is what we know from what we experience. The only thing Moses knew at this time was the burning bush. And so he's expecting the same kind of church service he had last week. He's expecting God to move the same way that he did the last time he was at the first assembly of the burning bush. And so he's getting ready to take his shoes off. He sees the parking lot. He's approaching and, and he's picking up his pace to get there. And he gets there and says, wait a minute. Let me, let me check my, my, my GPS. So, you know, something, something's gone. There should be burning. Okay, where's the next letter? That's the way I do it. I gotta find the letters. <laughs> Don't touch my phone. <laughs> He's sure something must be wrong. There's no burning bush. <laughs> There had to be some level of disappointment when he got there because that's the way we go to church. We go to church and we experience this last Sunday. So we expect to experience that same thing the next Sunday. That's our point of reference. But the bush is not burning. In fact, somebody moved the furniture. The bush is gone. And God then speaks to Moses. We jump ahead a little bit. About chapter 20. And everything changes. This is what's going to blow people away. Because God says, sanctify the people. For tomorrow I'm going to come, or in three days I'm going to come down unto them. And on the third day, I, 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 sometimes I just wish, when I get to heaven, after I spend a few thousand years with Jesus, I want to ask Moses, what was going through your mind? What were you thinking when you were expecting something to be a certain way and it wasn't? What went through your mind? What am I going to tell the church? Oh my goodness, what am I going to tell the board? You know, listen. They asked for his resignation, remember? When things don't go the way we expect, the way we plan, the way we used to and always do things, we get very uncomfortable. And that's why a lot of churches today are not moving in God's de definition of revival. Because most churches will say, sure, I want revival. But they have their own definition of what that's going to look like. And I'm going to tell you something right now. It will never look like what you think it will look like if it's a real revival. So God said, you thought you saw something with a burning bush? Watch this. <laughs> A whole mountain is in flames. And it says, and they, they heard, or they saw the smoke, and they saw the sound of the trumpets. You saw the sound of the trumpets. Wow. I've never heard that one before. But that's what it says. It must be so powerful. They, I mean, it... And the people backed away. I'm not going to that church. That is too radical. 
you guys feel fortunate because I'm not. I'm just going to come down and tell just tell the tell the message, and say you can look up all the scriptures and verify the the story in the Word of God. But so we know what happened again. The people pulled away. They quit the church. You go, we stay. You tell us what service is like. And so Moses climbs up that mountain. Now, I don't know. I would be with a lot of fear and trembling. I, you know, it takes a, a determination in the heart of a believer. It takes one that decides, I like what I've experienced, but I, I like this young man. Is this all there is? Isn't there, can't there be, shouldn't there be more than what I've experienced here? And so Moses bravely, not having a clue what's going to happen next, but he's desperate. He's hungry for more. Most people are satisfied at the burning bush. Most people, you can always get people to show up for the potluck. But when it comes to the cleanup, we can come to the Christmas cantata or the Easter production because that's nothing big is going to happen other than the story that I already know. And I've watched different versions of it over and over and over again for years. But come back on Sunday. Come back to that church. You want to know, most Pentecostal churches in most towns are tolerated. They're not accepted. You go to a ministerial gathering and they will put up with you and you can have, but don't expect them. You know, when you go to a, a group gathering, it will be that the standard of the lowest level always has been. Because they've become content over the years meeting at the foot of the mountain and enjoying the burning bush because it doesn't affect them. They watch the show. But this time, things are a little bit different. We had, Jim will remember this, God, he said it over and over again for, for a long time, God just said, come up higher. What does he mean, come up higher? What's that got to do with anything? I don't even know if he knew what it meant when he said it. I wanted to ask him. <laughs> he probably did. Maybe did. <laughs> because the next level, we talked about the fire and the glory. We ain't even there yet. We're now just going to the fire. Because he had... The call. He had the commission at the burning bush. He brought them there, disappointed that it wasn't burning anymore, that it was even gone. Somebody changed the furniture. And now, all of a sudden, this is a whole new ball game. Because in a revival church, he calls the shots. We just try to keep up. Because it isn't going to fit. You're not going to open your uh, doctrines of faith. It's not going to open in the tenets of faith of your, of your denomination. It's not going to be listed there. I'll guarantee you it's not. We had a spontaneous Jericho march in here years ago. And we had some, some gal in here in a tight, short skirt. Never, 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 didn't even know what was going on, but was going to hide in the crowd. And went around, they never came back. <laughs> because a spontaneous move of the Holy Spirit will assault your flesh. Because you're getting ready to get burned. I, I just tried to imagine when Moses gets close, what did he do? 
Did he stand there for a while? You know, you're getting ready to jump in the, in the swimming pool or in the river. You plug your nose and you take the leap. Moses has climbed this mountain. He hasn't got a clue what's about to transpire. But the good thing about it is, is he's hungry. He's willing to take the plunge. He knows it's God, so he knows that it's got to be good because God is good all the time. So he, it's not that he's afraid in the negative kind of afraid. The fear of God is certainly upon him because the mountain is shaking, nothing else. It's just that one, I always love this. <laughs> And so he's going up trying to make up a shaking mountain. <laughs> and he's standing there. And did he hesitate? Did he pause? This is not God. That's what people say. Anytime it assaults your, your, your flesh, your, your first response is, this is not God. That's what people say. I've watched it over and over again. I... I got a book in my office, by a, name, a guy, by, I think his name is Dewey, I can't remember now. And he said, did a study on revivals, you know, and he went down through his, the years, because I love to read and study about revivals. I got a list of stuff up here I can show you to prove, prove by the process, by the cycle of things that, that were at the edge of this return of Christ and the, and the uh, tribulation and the battle of Armageddon because proved by this history. And I got it up here. I'd rather I'll share it or not. I don't know. I may make a copy and give it to you. I may sell it to you because the hungrier you get and the stronger your desire to read the book. Uh, for 1995, I'll give you a copy and it's two pages. <laughs> Man, he had, to, he had to wad up his outline for how church is done. Because it's about ready to go up in smoke anyway. <laughs> and I just try to imagine, because it takes a hunger. It takes a strong desire to be in the presence of God. Not knowing what's getting ready to happen. It should be every time we come to church. There should be the fear of the Lord on us. And said, what is he going to do today? What is he going to assault in my flesh? Where is he wanting to bring us to that I can't get there unless? And so he looks back. He was smart. <laughs> I'm not going up to Josh. <laughs> Come with me, Joshua. You may have to drag me out. Joshua went up with him. Joshua didn't have a clue what he was there for. That's a whole nother message. And Moses said, I'm going in. Can you imagine that? Smoke. Fire. Voice of God speaking. I would be trembling. We've not, we've not, it says, and they tremble at his word. We don't tremble. It doesn't even phase us. And he's in the fire. Now, he was at the burning bush. He, he learned the lesson on holiness that you better not be like other people. You better, God is so holy. He is so different. And I've got to be, be willing to be different than the world. I've got, in an ascending way, I can't talk like, act like, do like, go like everybody else because we're different. And he goes in now. I wonder, did he take his shoes off again? And he steps in. And this must have been an experience that only way we know is what he said. But guess what's happened for those that are not willing to step inside the fire? They're going to party. What happened in the burning bush? God gave two specific things. The first thing he did, he wrote the declaration of dependence, not independence. 
We call it the Ten Commandments. God, the requirements for holiness. And he just wrote it down in short form. The ink hadn't even dried on the pages when they were breaking the first one down below. See, you have, you have no problem breaking the th plans and the ideas and the purposes of God when you don't know the God of the purpose. Moses' goal was to get the people from there to the presence of God, and when he got them there, they weren't even willing to go up. Because remember what God said? He tells them that the people might... Here, here. Do that, 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 Lydia Morrow. And, and God said, he's going to, listen to this, he's going to make them a nation of priests. And it wasn't even in his original plan to have Aaron in the priesthood. Did you know that? He, expected, he wanted the whole nation to be a nation of priests. Guess what? <laughs> he says the same thing about the church. You might be kings and priests unto God. You know how well that went well over with Israel. They failed miserably. I mean, like I said, the ink's not even dry on the, uh, off the press. And they're already down there breaking the commandments because they're going to do it their way. They're not going up there, but they're going to create their own idea and have their own worship down there. So what did they do? They brought the same thing that they worshipped in, in Egypt. They brought it out and rebuilt it. And I love what Aaron said. We just threw it in the fire and this came out. Liar. <laughs> the second thing that happened is God laid out the design not only how we're to live but how we're to worship he laid out the design on the temple However, everything had exactly the detail Donna mentioned that over and over again made according to pattern and you see that when it was built, Moses, in one verse, I think, I meant, uh, uh, one chapter, rather, it mentions about nine times in one chapter, when, as it's laying it out, as Moses had done, made according to pattern. When Solomon built the temple, it's a little bit different. He says it's made according to pattern as God had given it to his father David. There's a pattern that God has, but it doesn't have a, the end of that pattern is him. So now here we have Moses. He's experienced the burning bush, which radically changed his life, and he was ready to take on any and all obstacles, to face down any and all devils, to start an evangelistic ministry, and to go out and spread the good news and to bring everybody, a whole nation, to God. Just off of the burning bush. Now he's in the fire. And God's ready to set up a nation. This is, never, this is the... Israel was just a bunch of Hebrews before the mountain. When they got to the mountain and Moses went into the fire, now this is the first time in history that Israel was called a nation. And it was called a nation by God. Take that, Muslims. You think you're going to wipe them out? I don't think so. Never happen. But that's at a burning bush. That's at the fire. Moses went down. Now he's facing off the nation. He's chewing them out. He broke the first thing. Now he's got to chisel out. That, Moses was a chiseler. <laughs> he had to chisel out and chisel them all in. How would you spell that? <laughs> would you text me on that one? You know? <laughs> Post it on Facebook. <laughs> You're facing the book. <laughs> and now, now Moses is, is Moses is starting to think here. 
Remember, he has now spent 80 days because he went down after 40 days. He went down and turned around and went right back up. Wow. Now there's a church service. Already we've been two full days in high places. And we're looking forward to Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Our flesh is. 80 days. But you know, it goes fast. Like I said, when you get beyond this point in his presence and you get passed into that holy of holies, that, that, that next level of encounter, time is gone. When God is there, time becomes irrelevant. You don't want to leave. Oh, you remember some of those days? We didn't want to leave. I can remember leaving Don sitting on the floor about 3.30 in the afternoon, still from our Sunday morning service. Don, you need to get out. The janitor's coming. <laughs> we didn't think anything about it. Because when you're in his presence, everything changes. But it, it, comes, it had to come to his mind after these encounters, what God had done. So then he said, he realized there's got to be more. That was so cool. I was, that I was, my life was changed, never be the same again down here at the foot of the mountain. Now, this is how you want me to live. This is my relationship with you. Now, he said, show me your glory. What did he say? Man, I want to see you. I want to know you. But God, in defense of Moses, said, I can't do that. Because you won't survive it. But he says, this is what, this is Exodus chapter 33. And so God says, go down and come back up and, and, and I'll hide you. And we sing it, he hideth my soul. We don't even know what we're singing about. In the cleft of the rock. We sing so many songs, and I love the hymn because they're, they're a message. Like we were talking about there, you know, sing this, let's sing the first, second, and fourth verses of this song. We leave out a whole encounter, a whole experience. Remember how we used to do that? Why did we do that? Because it took too long to get through a five-line, five-verse song. But I love the message. I love the journey because hymns are about a journey. It doesn't diminish the choruses because I love them too, but they're a whole different category. Don't, you can't put the two in the same category, but you can put the two in the same place. Yes. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus saith the Lord. I sang a hymn I hadn't sang in years, and I sang all three verses. Shocked me. I still knew them. <laughs> of course, you were fortunate you weren't here to hear it. Show me your glory. You would have thought what he had would have been, most of us would have said, that'll, that'll last me a lifetime. I can write a lot of books about this. Well, Moses did. He wrote five of them. <laughs> and by the way, they become bestsellers. He said, there's got to be more. You ever imagine that? There's got to be more. So God lays out the plan. And he says, I'll show, I can't show you me directly, but I can show you where I've been. How do you think he knew Genesis, the book of Genesis? He wasn't there. God revealed it to him on the mountain. He showed him every place. I'll show you my goodness. Everything that I've done from the creation of man that brought it all the way up to, to where we're at today. Indelibly written in his spirit. In the glory of God. He got a glimpse of God that we could only long for. But why? We think, wow. He, that 
presence of God's glory. When he came down after encountering that glory, he encountered the burning bush. He, he experienced the fire, and we thought that would be enough because now you know the whole story there. And now he's going back, and now this is not about them. This is about you and me. This next, this is about you and me. I'm on my own journey now. Has nothing to do with Israel. It has specifically to do with me. Lord, he didn't say show them. He didn't say show us. He said show me your glory. I'm going further. There's a time in our walk with God that it becomes very personal. And we have to be willing to, to lay everything else and everyone else aside. I don't, I, I'm not worried about what other people are going to say. I'm not worried about what other people are going to think. I just want to see him. I want to step in and experience the fullness of who he is. And he might have been somewhat disappointed, but I'll tell you what, that what he experienced Radically, it so changed his life when he came down off the mountain just with what he experienced at that time his face glowed I haven't seen anybody leave church yet with a glowing face okay I'd like to think after that day I got saved uh, my face glowed because everything else sure did <laughs> I said wow that's it over. Moses, you're the man. But guess what? There's more. What? He just stepped into the glory. Let me, let me give you this verse. I will find it here. It's after the, the histories of revival and the results of those things that took place. It's in Exodus 40. Verses 34 and 35. It says, And a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses, you think it arrived? There's a level of glory you will never experience because you can't handle it. After, we would have thought, wow, Moses, you can handle anything. There's more to God than what you can imagine. There is more than what we know. More, I, it is hard for us to break out of the rut of the sameness. There are comfort zones. You know, the, the biggest people that resist revival are old timers as a whole. Because every, re this is true. History proves this to be true. Every revivalist believes that what they experienced in their revival was everything that God has. And that everything stopped at that point. And so when the next wave of God's movement takes place, they're the first ones to reject it. If it doesn't fit their criteria, going back to that book on revival that I was talking about a while ago when he writes all this about all of these revivals and then the great awakenings and all of these things, when it came to the Zusa Street revival, it almost got no mention at all, only maybe in one or two sentences long, and that was it. Because they cannot, much of the church world cannot, will not refuse to accept the Pentecostal move of God, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and everything that it entails. They refuse. They deny the power thereof. And so in order to accept, they will tolerate you, but they will not tolerate what you believe. Stephen was just telling me earlier today that about a pastor down there that has kicked a kid. His parents go to that church, been in that church for years, but they kicked this guy because he's spirit-filled and they want nothing to do with it in their church. Am I right? We went to that meeting in Beaverton in a, in a Nazarene church. They just built the building and what was her name? 
Ruth Ward, Ruth Ward Heflin. She left Israel. So her ministry was in Israel. And this was in the heat of the Brownsville revival and what God was doing. We always say Brownsville because that was the center identifying point. But by this time, revivals were breaking out, spots them all over the country, all around the world. And so she came in order, she wanted to help feed and nurture the revival in America. And she was speaking. Some of you went there with us at that church, and they built this beautiful church, and the platform was out, round platform out in the middle, and everybody was, seats were all sitting around the platform, and, and before, the pastor said, before he introduced Ruth Ward Heflin to the platform, he said, this will be my, my last service here. I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the Methodist church kicked me out, or Nazarene church kicked me out. We had, a, we had an Episcopal church here in Klatske and I. When he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they shut the church down. They kicked him out, shut the church down. The same time frame, the Methodist pastor in this town got the, at the same meeting, got the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence speaking in tongues, and he got kicked out. They do not want the moving of the Spirit. So folks, if you're waiting for them, they're going to be down there in the mountain. They're going to draw themselves far away. They're going to be building their golden calves. But those that are hungry for God and know that there's more, they're going to be willing to lay it all aside. They're going to be willing to lay aside their religious doctrines and beliefs if it stops them from advancing in the things of God. Guy asked me the other day, in fact, I was, I was talking to, uh, or no, the we've, we've, guy posted it on there. He said, been, in the, been a, a Methodist pastor for 52 years. After 52 years, he resigned. He says, I'm not leaving the church. They left me. When they entered in and accepted and doctrined wokeism, homosexuality, transgenderism and all this garbage of demonic and they are welcoming demons into their churches now we will welcome the homosexual in here because the goal is to get them free but we will not change our doctrine, our beliefs about what this is because it is a bondage it's a deception, it's a lie and it will send them straight to hell the Bible says they shall not have part in the kingdom of God. It said Revelation 21, 8, 9. So we've got to be loving enough to tell them the truth and show them the plan to get free. Yes. But you will never exhaust God. And, and God is so diversified that what was it? He may do one thing in your life and another thing in another person's life in the same service. He may be moving one way in this service in this church and another way in another church in, uh, in someplace else. But if it's God, it's his business. Because he's so diversified. He will do if we will allow him to do what needs to be done to get the people to where they need to be so that they will be ready to make it to heaven when he comes. So you follow the cycle of revival. And let's go back to 1400. And I'm not going to tell you about it. i just tell you the, the experience of what it is. Just following the dates. You just follow the dates. And you follow the revival. And right after every revival was a major war. Right up to today. After every revival within, within less than five years, a war broke out. From the first great, great Awakening that brought the Revolutionary War, the second Great Awakening brought, followed by the Civil War, and then you come, you come forward into the Azusa Street, the Decade of Revivals, and, and, and that was followed by World War I. You come into the Healing Revivals in the 40s and 50s and followed by uh, in World War II. Then you come into the uh, 60s and 70s and the revival of the Jesus Movement, Charismatic Movement. Into that time, it was the Vietnam War. You come into the Brownsville revival and it was the Iran-Iraq war proves this point out so the last revival are you ready for this? the last revival that's getting ready to break out will be followed by guess what it's the cycle you can follow it you can go back to David I just shot it out there real quick and so now I got the freebie you don't have to buy the book oh, okay I'll sell it to you for $5.95 are you following me? There's more. 
We had a wonderful worship time here tonight. And just coming to that place uh, where you're just, I don't know, I'm, I'm afraid to move. I don't want to disrupt what God is doing. If I speak, that's, I watch, oh, look over once at my wife, and she said, we, you know, we do this. <laughs> what do I do? What do I go? And we're looking around, and, and you guys are all, every one of you, you're just lost in his presence. And you look at, wow, wasn't Friday night awesome? That worship, that's the burning bush compared to the glory on the mountain. There's more. Let us never stand to your feet so I can close this out. Because I'm going to pray for you tonight. You can never exhaust God. There's more. Like this young teenage boy. We, I, I, I think we're there again a Sunday morning, the Lord willing. I, I'm preaching on breaking the vicious cycle. You guys, what's a vicious cycle? I'm not speaking about if we have two or three services and they're all good, but they look at it in the patterns the same. That's, that's okay because it's made according to pattern. But God is expanding. God is moving. There's more because it's not about the content of the service and as far as the worship and the intercession, the word. All of that should be in every service. The worship, the word, and sometimes, it, and, and, and let me say this, when I say service, we think service is 1030 to noon. Service starts the moment you walk through that door. Amen. If it's 9 o'clock, 930, so don't expect everything when you walk in here, don't, don't ever expect everything to happen in an hour and a half. Because you may get the word over there, and we may get intercession and in, may not get past it or we may get war, intercession and worship together well where's the word well if you were faithful and came to the house of God were committed to what God is doing you would have got it already you would have started off your service with the word we got to get away from this because that's man's structure how many of you have Sunday morning I <laughs> somebody asked me that time. oh we have X number of people how many of you have Sunday night I said, the same number. No, no, no. How many people come? The same number. Everybody that comes Sunday morning comes Sunday night. It should be that way in every church. Well, how about Wednesday night? Same number. Because it isn't about going to church. It's about relationships. It's about the table of showbread fellowship and relationship. It's about the word, the, lamp, the, the, the lampstand. It's about, it's about worship and intercession. It's, it's all of these combined, in it, and we, we may not get them all. And we may not get it all in on this Sunday, but we can always end it if we don't with, at the end of the service, to be continued. Yes. Come to the altars. But only if you're hungry for more.